afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, Ozone, Nature's Super Sanitizer and Shelf Life Extender. My name is Amy. I'm a member of the marketing team at Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, Inc. I'll be facilitating today's webinar and offering technical support to our speakers. Today, we're excited to be welcoming a trio of industry experts for a roundtable discussion about the applications of ozone for food safety. And I'll be introducing them to you all a little later on in the broadcast. Just before we get started, I wanna go over a few housekeeping notes. To ensure audio quality, all of our attendees today are on mute. However, we do absolutely wanna take any questions you might have. So to ask a question, you can go ahead and type it into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar control panel and click send. We'll answer as many of these as we have time for at the end of the prepared slides. And you don't have to wait until the end of the broadcast to send those questions in. So as you think of them during the roundtable discussion, go ahead and send those questions our way so we can get them to our uh, speakers. Uh, some of the most frequently asked questions we get include, where can I get the slides from the broadcast or will a recording be available? And the slides will be available for download from the PGRFSI website. And the recording will also be posted to our YouTube channel for you to review or if you'd like to share it with those who couldn't attend the live session. Just really quickly wanna show you how to open the uh, questions tab. If you click the triangle on the left-hand side of the tab, that will open up a box where you can type your question in and click send. And as I said before, we will respond to as many questions as we have time for at the end. And before I introduce our first speaker today, I wanted to just quickly get a feel for who's in the audience today with a quick polling question. So just choose whichever option um, you know, best describes your situation with your organization. The first question is, is your organization currently certified to a GFSI standard? All responses to these polls from today's webinar will be completely anonymous, so feel free to answer however you wish. I'll wait for about 60% participation before we move along. Thank you to everyone who's voting. And welcome to those who have come in a few minutes late. All right, so getting some great participation on this poll. So thank you again for engaging with us. And that's how everyone voted today. So it seems like there's not as much interest in certification today, but I'm sure all of you wanna hear more about ozone. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker, and that's Paul DeMarin. He is the Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Supply Chain for us here at PGRFSI. Paul joined us in January last year and has over 35 years of experience in the hospitality, service, and retail agri-food sectors. Paul's a board member of the OFPA, that's the Ontario Food Protection Association, as well as an advisory council member with the George Washington University School of Business for their digital marketing certificate program. Before he joined us at PGFSI, Paul worked for 16 years in the certification industry with clients in every sector from food safety and supply chain to brand protection and quality. Paul's also worked for many years in management system certification. And prior to that, Paul was a professional chef and a consultant for over 20 years. So without further ado, Paul, I'm gonna hand things over to you and you can take it away when you're ready. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Thank you, everyone. I see we have a lot of people on today's call, so that is amazing. I'm very excited to be back into the full swing of our webinar schedule. Uh, I was just telling Amy this morning that uh, since the beginning of February, we have completed five and we have 25 more to go. <laughs> Uh, by the end of June. So it's going to be very, very busy. Um, there's a lot of great things we're going to be talking about today. Uh, after I go through and do a quick uh, high-level overview of our company, um, we're going to get into the uh, main topic. And instead of uh, a slide show that we typically would do during a webinar, it's going to be more of a panel style interview. Uh, so we're actually quite excited for that. And I also have the pleasure of welcoming uh, three special guests with me today. Uh, they're all experts in the industry as it relates to ozone and ozone technology, and we're going to be discussing uh, that using ozone as a super sanitizer uh, with uh, James, Ernie, and Peter. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining. Uh, so let's jump right in. Uh, PJR, uh, we're part of a family of companies, and we were founded in uh, 1994 by Perry Johnson himself. Uh, we've really been at the forefront of certification and uh, registration from the very beginning. Uh, we achieved uh, ANAB accreditation as well as UCAS accreditation over the years. Uh, and then we started expanding globally in 1995. And as you can see, uh, we're currently uh, conducting assessments in about 60 countries around the world. We have offices in about 20. 
Um, there's different divisions of our company. Perry Johnson Registrars is the side of the business that does certification auditing for, uh, we'll call it non-food type uh, businesses. So that would be aerospace, automotive, uh, medical, uh, information security, quality, environmental health and safety, those types of standards. Uh, we have PJR FSI uh, that was founded in 2012 and who I represent. Um, we were, um, uh, you know, essentially born as a result of uh, the demand in the industry for food safety certification and standards from many global uh, companies and, and retailers and scheme owners. Uh, we conduct audits today uh, to many different types of programs uh, on the food side. We also have a business called PJNA, and that is our uh, healthcare technology company. We do services like uh, medical coding, telemedicine services, virtual scribing. We have Perry Johnson Laboratory and Associates, uh, or sorry, uh, Laboratory Accreditation Body. And that is the business that um, conducts accredited certification audits to ISO 17025 for laboratories around the world. So um, moving on here, over the last nine years, We've really worked in every area of the, um, uh, uh, virtually every sector, excuse me, uh, in the industry. We work with retailers, farms, importers and exporters, uh, distribution companies. And when we're out there working with these companies and partnering with them, the main goal is to help them manage uh, the risk in their business from either a food safety perspective, supply chain quality or brand protection. Um, we work with all of our clients to deliver a high level of, um, you know, uh, value and customer satisfaction for our clients, while at the same time uh, ensuring that we promote uh, professionalism as well as technical competence through the services that we do. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're in 60 countries around the world. We have about 460 auditors on our team that covers over 30 different programs. Um, if you take a look and uh, due to you know COVID that uh, hit us all very hard in 2020, the certification industry was deemed essential because it's really based on the results of certification tests, uh, inspections and audits. And it gives confidence to you and me as the consumer uh, that an organization's products are being thoroughly evaluated against recognized uh, international standards by a competent third party. Um, and in today's market, I think this is even more critical because the landscape continues to change on a very regular basis. Uh, there seems to be new recalls every day, uh, different regulations popping up everywhere, uh, labeling requirements that are new. Uh, and navigating that landscape can be a real challenge to uh, all organizations of any scope or size. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we define uh, how we support our clients into four areas. Uh, auditing and certification to globally recognized third-party accredited standards like ISO 9001 or any of the Global Food Safety Initiative standards, GFSI. We do second-party auditing, which are standards that we've written and developed, uh, but they're not accredited. That example could be a good manufacturing practices audit or a good distribution practices audit or HACCP. Those are uh, examples of standards that we've written our own and clients will often use um, our own standards uh, because they're really, you know, uh, quick. They've been vetted. They're out of the box. Uh, you don't need a lot to get those programs up and going. Uh, a lot of our customers have their own uh, what we call first party uh, audits. And these are ones that where the customer has written their standard. Uh, an example of that could be uh, Costco has certain uh, standards that they use. Uh, that they've written and developed. McDonald's has others. Um, you know, those are just a couple of examples. And then we offer training for all of the services that we uh, conduct audits to as well. So I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on this. Uh, as I mentioned, we have about 30 different programs um, that we support. A lot of these are accredited, some are unaccredited. Um, you know, clients are uh, subjected still to countless different types of audits in the industry. Some are government regulated, some are retailer mandated. Um, but we work primarily with uh, all areas of the um, supply chain in virtually every sector as well. Uh, and also, I guess, just finally on this, um, PJR FSI were, uh, I believe in many cases, we were the first certification body to be recognized, but we are um, among many CBs who are recognized to perform government uh, inspection audits, such as the Foreign Supplier uh, Verification Program or the Food Safety Modernization Act for FISMA or even the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program. So if you have any interest in those, then you know, you know where to reach us as well. Um, so now 
we have a longstanding relationship uh, with many organizations around the world, accreditation bodies and scheme owners alike. Uh, this gives um, assurance and confidence to our customer that the family of companies we operate under are following the rules of accreditation and scheme owners. And that helps to regulate us as a certification body and to maintain a high quality uh, and standards in our work. It's certainly a large investment that's made every year, but it's well worth it because it gives you confidence that you've partnered with a uh, recognized and respected partner. Okay, and then finally, um, I, I just wanna wrap up my portion here and again say thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, I've said this before, but hopefully it's not gonna be too much longer before we get to see everybody again uh, at uh, either client meetings or conferences and trade shows. And um, I do thank you for joining today. I'm going to pass it back to you, Amy, for another polling question, I think. Yep, that's right. We've got another polling question for you all right before we start that uh, roundtable discussion. And this is just to get a feel for the audience. Um, how familiar are you with ozone technology? As I mentioned before, all the responses to these polls are anonymous, so feel free to vote however uh, is most uh, applicable to you. And I will go ahead and wait for some participation there, and we'll roll right along into introducing our speakers. And just a reminder before we get into that round table, I do encourage everyone, uh, as you think of questions, please go ahead and send those in. You don't have to wait until the end of the slides to send us your questions. We'd love to take as many as we can, so keep them coming in. All right, great amounts of participation today on the polls. I wanna say thank you to everyone who voted. And this is how it all shook out. It looks like a lot of people have heard about ozone, but maybe aren't super familiar with the applications. All right, Paul, I'm gonna hand things back to you if you would go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Thanks very much, uh, Amy. That was very interesting on the polls. I was actually surprised of the number of people that are fully familiar with the benefits, so that's great. Um, okay, again, thanks, Amy. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome our uh, three distinguished uh, key executives from the industry. Uh, they're very well known and are here to share their experience and expertise with us. So let me just first start by introducing them. Uh, Peter Rubenstein is the president of Pressure Techniques. It's a 45-year-old company that specializes in the design, manufacture, sales, and installation of spray systems for food, bakery, uh, meat, and processing industries. Peter attended uh, Boston University and Springfield College and has an extensive background in electronics, flow control, and liquid systems. Peter's designed and innovated unique equipment for high-pressure cleaning, sanitizing systems, uh, glazing, coating, release, misting, dust control, and ingredient applications. And when the use of ozone became legal years ago, Peter pioneered the use of small systems for meat and seafood industries. Peter's a member of the Instrument Society of America, the International Ozone Association, and the Food Industry Task Force, as well as the International Association for Food Protection and the Association for Facilities Engineering. James Velakas has been working in the food and beverage industry for 46 years and has been auditing and consulting for the past four years with our company, Perry Johnson, under the SQF program. During this time, he's been a very strong advocate of ozone technology, both for sanitation and direct contact of food. And it's also clear that these technologies can be far superior to other chemicals on the market today, uh, currently uh, being used that leave residuals and are dangerous to the employees that handle those chemicals. Now we have uh, Ernie Wilmanick, and Ernie is a professional consultant in ozone technology. He is the president of the Key Water and Air International from May 1969 to October 2010. He's currently president of Agroizine Consultants and has over 40 years of experience in design, engineering, and manufacturing of water treatment technologies in a myriad of applications. In November of 2012, P, uh, excuse me, Ernie gave a presentation by Agroizine and Ozognation, one of the most beneficial and innovative processes of our time at the international conference in, uh, I'm gonna say this wrong, New Brindenburg, Germany, and in Poland. The Congress was hosted by the University of Applied Sciences and the West Pomeranian University of Techn uh, Te Technology, excuse me. Ernie has worked in several fields with experience in private industry and emergency response operations. 
Well, this is an absolutely uh, amazing panel that we have. Your experience, gentlemen, is overwhelming, and I do really thank you very much for joining. So let's get going and to the part where I think everybody is very much looking forward to. I am now going to uh, ask our panel a series of questions and give them a couple of minutes each to uh, discuss each of my questions. At the end of the panel, we're gonna open it up for audience Q&A. So at the very beginning, like Amy uh, mentioned, please, if you have any questions for the experts, write them into the chat box and Amy will uh, go through those at the end of the um, panel. So again, thanks gentlemen. Peter, uh, I would like to start off with you. Um, you know, in, an, in, in a nutshell, what is ozone and how is it produced? Thank you. Um, ozone, for those that are uninitiated, is a, a, a gas that you would smell if you walk by a coffee machine or you smell it after a thunder and lightning storm or somebody welding, you'll smell the ozone. Uh, it's a very unstable inorganic molecule, for those that are interested in the science of it. But if it's mixed with water, uh, it becomes probably one of the most powerful oxidizers to kill bacteria as well as other things. Right now, I'm, con uh, I'm going to be concerned with killing bacteria in food plants, and we'll go with that. Uh, the trick of ozone is efficiency and able to harness it so you can uh, you can put it in the water stream and spray it throughout your plant. Uh, a couple ways of making ozone, those that are interested, one is corona discharge, which is uh, high voltage in the uh, Pyrex type tube, and it makes uh, an arc, which in the presence of oxygen will uh, create ozone gas. There are other ways of making it that are less efficient, uh, such as UV, plasma blocks, and what have you. But right now, the popular way that we make ozone is corona discharge. It's very efficient, and the machinery that we have and is on the market will combine it with water, and you'll get your levels of ozone. Uh, the trick to keep is to keep the gas with the water, which you know from high school physics, oppose each other. So the difference between one ozone machine and the other really is the efficiency in the way they operate and how much gas they can trap in the water stream. Uh, we're looking for maybe 90 to 100 percent efficiencies because that will benefit the user. So that's ozone in a nutshell, the way it's made. Great, thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate that. Um, now, James, I'd like to ask you a question. In, in your opinion, how does, because uh, we've talked about this in you know, the lead up to this as well, but how does the use of ozone help save the environment, um, save money, and really help protect people from uh, various diseases that are out there, such as cancer? Well, thank you. <clears throat> ozone gas and ozonated water solution is a certified organic treatment that was approved by the United States in the year 2000. These two forms have the ability to destroy the actual pesticide molecule themselves. In other words, the, the ozone molecule is so reactive, it can break apart other molecules and the pesticide molecules are some of the ugliest going. These two forms have the ability to destroy the pesticide molecules themselves. The ozone is used it can reduce the amount of chemicals that are used in the environment. And as everybody knows, you know, many cases of cancer are caused by these chemicals that are being used daily. <clears throat> Ozone has been made um, recently newsworthy around the world that it can kill the uh, COVID-19 virus with a less than 10 second exposure. Again, that molecule can attack the virus and destroy its ability to latch onto cells. Uh, recently, and uh, Ernie will talk about it a little bit later, has developed a new technology which makes a micro-sized particle of the ozonated water, which can be sprayed throughout and 
it's completely safe, even with people. And this use in uh, restaurants, nursing homes, hospitals, et cetera. Right now, people are all over the country and all over the world are spraying everything with dangerous chemicals, which leaves um, residuals on everything. And, and Ernie had talked about it a little bit, but these residuals can cause cancer, whereas ozone is completely natural and it reverts back to O2 in a half-life and is completely safe. Oh, it's great, James. I really appreciate that. That's uh, so interesting and, and, you know, timely as well, especially when we're, you know, still very much in the uh, global pandemic that we're all facing. So it, it's very important to hear that. Um, okay, now, Ernie, I have somewhat of a two-part question for you. First is, uh, is ozone a pesticide? And the second would be, uh, does ozone treatment leave any um, residue? All right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would uh, say good afternoon from the beautiful hill country here in Texas. And uh, I hope that you all will learn a lot about this world's nature's super sanitizer. So welcome again, everybody out there. The first uh, part of my question is, is ozone a pesticide? No, ozone is not a pesticide. Ozone is a regulatory approved antimicrobial agent. So ozone was affirmed and has the grass status, what means general recognized as safe for direct con contact with foods already by the FDA in June 2001. The EPA classifies an apparatus such as Agriosian's advanced AC control, ozogation slash hydroxyl radicals process in conjunction with an O0 line custom built air blast sprayer applying ozonated water, for example, for controlling diseases in the vineyard, 100% natural as a pesticide device. But when you, as a manufacturer, uh, you claim that the, your system, let's say, can eradicate diseases, in other words, kills the bugs. It is necessary that the manufacturing establishment is re registered by the EPA. So Agriosi's EPA establishment number is zero, uh, sorry, 090489TX01. Ozogation in its totality is capable of eradication, oxidation, cellularizing, and inactivation based on a high oxidation reduction potential. It's called ORP. That ORP level is very important when we look into it, the eradication or oxidation. So we produce always an oxidation reduction potential uh, above 750 millivolts, what makes that we can control these diseases. The second part of my question was, does ozone treatment leave any residue? No. Uh, as James already mentioned it, ozone is an approved food additive in the US and can be added directly to food services, uh, services, etc. as a disinfectant. So since ozone rapidly reverts to oxygen, its half-life is only 25 minutes. It does not leave any residue. It is environmental friendly and provides a convenient means of improving sanitation. I hope that satisfied your question. Yes, it did, uh, Ernie. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, I have to uh, say that the entire topic so far and the meetings that we've all had leading up to this has been very eye opening for me. Um, I, uh, you know, plead ignorance in the fact that before this webinar, I literally thought of ozone depletion and, and I thought of it in completely the wrong uh, way. So it, for me, this is just amazing and I want to thank you all. Um, so, James, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there, um, as well as myself, asking the question, uh, but how does uh, ozone work to benefit the sanitation industry? Because all plants out there have to sanitize its requirements. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, in the sanitation industry, 
the initial cost of the um, ozone systems are a fraction of what's going to be charged for the cleaning chemicals and detergents and sanitizers over time. The ozone equipment uh, will make either an ozone gas or a water solution for many years with no extra cost, reducing overhead costs, improving the shelf life, and being safer to handle for employees and customers. The chemical sanitizing industry relies on the sale of the costly detergents, pesticides, sanitizers, etc. And the companies must continue to purchase these year after year. They also install very sophisticated chemical handling systems to keep the employees safe when they're making and using the required solution. Whereas ozone, Equipment requires only electricity and water to make ozone. There is no further requirements or funds after the initial purchase. All the walls, ceilings, floors can be safely cleaned and sanitizing using a two to four part per million uh, water solution. One plant I know of has 40 rooms containing ozone water drops hoses for all the cleaning and sanitizing requirements. The ozone water solution also goes down in the processing drains and reduces the bio load in the drains and also kills any pathogenic organisms like E. coli and listeria, et cetera. And again, using these solutions is completely safe for all the processing employees that use and handle the ozone solution hoses. Also, small units can be purchased for the home use. <clears throat> and sterilize possible contamination in light items like the mail, food, fruits, vegetables. They also can be used to sanitize the entire home. These units cost as little as $50 and up to about $300. <clears throat> I take one of these small units with me when I travel. The small units only require 120 volt outlet to make ozone, ozone, ozone gas. My family has been using one of these small units um, since the beginning of the pandemic. These small units only make ozone gas and are not and not the water solution. To get the ozone water requires pressure and time, and that would, of course, increase the cost. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much, James. I appreciate that. Uh, just moving back to Ernie for a minute with more of an agricultural question here, but uh, Ernie, what is the impact of ozonation on insects in, say, a vineyard or other fields that are out there? Okay, thank you. That's an interesting question. Uh, when we look into uh, the world of uh, vineyards, uh, there is a high demand of controlling all the diseases. Diseases getting completely out of hand throughout the world because we were using chemicals, chemicals, and chemicals, and a lot of diseases are get resistant against all these chemicals we used through all the years behind us. It is um, it is proven and documented by several of our national and wide world users of ozogation in, in, the, in the vineyards, as I said before, and these units are like in Canada, in the United States, of course, like in Israel, in France, we have them in the Republic of Georgia, in France and Italy, in New Zealand and Australia. And they all uh, say that after a while, the beneficial insects are returning. And that's amazing when you think about it, we need these beneficial insects to, uh, to control all other diseases. Uh, it can be explained uh, when we look at the aerobics and the anaerobics. Yeah, the higher concentration of oxygen, so O3, the three atom oxygen molecule, supports the aerobics and stops or discourages the anaerobics. We even received a picture from the vineyard uh, of Marco Voluca in the uh, uh, Russi Superiori in uh, Friuli in Italy, 
showing a beehive in the vineyards. Now, when that tells you not how healthy a vineyard is, then I don't have an answer. It's also proven that ozugation has an impact on the factors that spreading the diseases. So can stop the factors what cause, uh, for, for example, uh, the black cicatoga disease in, in, in the banana industry throughout the world. Uh, a field test at a vineyard here in, um, in uh, the hill country showed even that we can eradicate the bacterium in the xylem of a vine by cellulizing. And you say that's a lot of words, Ernie. I will explain it and try it at least, try to explain it in a few words. The bacterium, what is brought by a fact, factor inside of the xylem of the plant. So the xylem is what, uh, what makes the nutrients and the water yeah, out of the ground through the xylem in, into the vine. And causing a blockage in that, in that xylem. So our task was to find out that we could stop uh, this cause of the, what's called the Peterson's disease by uh, opening the, the xylem again and have free flow of the water and the nutrients. And we were able to stop this disease by ozone the treatment. But what we had to do to prove that we had to go with needles and ozonated water with an oxidation reduction potential of 953 millivolts to eradicate that bacterium inside of the plant, so inside of the xylem. So there again, we have a big, huge uh, example of how we control, can control the diseases throughout the world by not using all these chemicals. So there was a very interesting question. Thank you so much. No, thank you, uh, Ernie. I, I think that's uh, such an important topic too, especially for a lot of our uh, clients are in the pre-farm uh, gate realm. So uh, I'm sure they appreciated that. Okay, uh, Peter, uh, I'd like to come back to you for a moment. Um, really kind of a general question, but how can ozone help your company today? I think we all agree to the power of ozone, but what it does in the average food plant it gives you a new level of protection, which definitely everyone needs. So your product will come out with lower bacteria counts, whether it's fresh, frozen, ready to eat or whatever. But what does that mean? It means that you have longer shelf life. The uh, You can find new markets further away if, if it's a fresh product. But also remember that when your product is out of your hands, goes into a market, a restaurant, it's abused. You have a product that has a lower bacteria count, which will give the, the housewife, the chef, whatever, the buyer, uh, a lot more leeway uh, to, to have a pure product. So we're looking at shelf life, we're looking at markets and whatever. The side issue is that, we'll, and this is important too, it will save on chemicals especially sanitizers. No, it won't replace soap and water, but it will replace a lot of the sanitizers. I'm a big advocate for residual sanitizers, so I don't want those to go. But for continuous sanitation in a plant, ozonated water is absolutely the thing. And as uh, Ernie pointed out, uh, or no, I'm sorry, James pointed out, there's no cost other than the cost of water and electricity. One side issue, we found that plants are using ozonated water continuously. Their BODs and COD discharge levels go down dramatically. So do their fines. So I think you'll find that the use of ozone will give you a great payback, a pure product, and a marketing edge. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Um, James, another two-part question for you, if I may. Uh, what are some examples today of current uses uh, of ozone in some of today's environments? And the second part is, are there any particular benefits of those uses? Okay, this is my uh, favorite question because uh, I, I'll give you a number of examples, but this should trigger you to start thinking about something in your plant or your ability to, to use ozone and make a breakthrough. 
Uh, in fact, I just discovered one this week. Uh, before the uh, I was visiting a uh, maple syrup operation locally here in Connecticut, and they put these uh, tan networks through the trees and and collect all the sap. And at the end of the year, in the beginning of the year, there's no way to clean this tubing. And with ozone, you can inject ozonated water through the tubing, which will kill any bacteria, yeast, and mold, and then completely turn back to oxygen and be completely safe. And then also you can use it throughout the plant for cleaning uh, drums. And then finally, to seal off the entire plant and flood it with ozone gas and clean and kill all the bacteria, yeast, and mold that's on surfaces including the uh, the concrete floor. So that's something that, you know, it, it's a perfect application for ozone. But other applications, uh, I don't know if anybody realizes, but Olympic swimming pools throughout the world are now required to use ozone to purify the water instead of bromine and chlorine. And the ozone doesn't affect your eyes and throats and nasal passages like, uh, like bromine and chlorine does, so that's interesting. And the seafood processing plants, uh, again, a solution to two to four parts per million is used uh, on the fish fillets before it's packaged and also on machines that are um, skinning and um, doing other processes. And again, as, as um, Peter talked about, this increases the shelf life for two to three days more. And again, that, that's beneficial to the company and the consumers. The wine industry is another one that's been using ozone for years. First to clean the oak drums that the wine goes into for aging. And then finally using ozone gas in the aging areas to uh, keep any mold from forming on the outside of the drums. Uh, recently, uh, drinking water systems in jet airplanes have been treated with ozonated water at two to four parts per million. And it takes about 20 minutes to drain down the, the water that's in the systems, put in ozonated water uh, for a half an hour and drain that down and fill it with potable water again. Delta and Southwest, Air, Southwest Airlines are two of the airlines that are currently using this. Some supermarkets are using an ozonation solution to uh, spray on their uh, produce, again, keeping the bio load down and giving them uh, an extended shelf life and, and for the customers. The bottled water that we all take for granted has a small amount of ozone added to each bottle, which gives us the uh, two year shelf life, which we all take for granted. Ozone again can be sprayed on apples and peaches and other fruit orchards in place of uh, pesticides. And as a result of this, uh, it's safer for the operator and the safer for the uh, people buying the fruit and so on. In California, the people that do the spraying of pesticides have to have their blood tested every month to make sure that they don't have levels of pesticides that's unsafe for them. Whereas ozone, there's no worry about their health at all. In the uh, apple cider industry, bathing the apples in ozonated water before it's uh, crushed and squeezed into the final um, apple cider reduces the bio load considerably. And again, show, the shelf life will be extended by a week or two weeks. Again, that's money in everybody's pocket. So these are a few examples, there are many, many more. And, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to see what's happening and see these wins. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, it, I think you touched on this a little bit. Uh, and Ernie, you know, based on our discussions, uh, th there's been, uh, you know, discussion around ozone misting. So. How, in your opinion, does an ozone misting process uh, inactivate the coronavirus in the air? 
Yeah, that is, uh, I almost have to say the question of the day. Uh, it's scary. It's scary what we do uh, since the coronavirus. Uh, the only thing what was um, recognized by the CDC was to uh, spray chemicals, pesticides, or in general, they call it quads, on all the services that they could come up with. And um, when I was looking at what was going on, uh, okay, we have to change our whole vision uh, with uh, building and uh, engineering and manufacturing our equipment and create a, a mobile misting process, what we use for years, so 50 plus years throughout the world uh, in the vineyards and orchards and banana plantations, what we talked about before, and come up with uh, that same capacity to um, eliminate the coronavirus by not using any chemicals. The problem is what they are doing, and I come back on your question with the misting process, was spraying on the surfaces. Uh, my question would be then for everybody out there, uh, why are we told to use masks when the, when the threat is on the surface of where we sit, like in the school, on the desk, or the chairs, or, or the, the walls. No, that threat is in the air. So we had to stop the air. We had to stop, sorry, we had to stop the virus in the air. So now coming back to your question, yes, so we had to design a misting process but could use the ozone technology but has the capacity to inactivate the coronavirus in less than five seconds in the air. So let me go through some details with that. First of all, the molecule sized water droplet, what we created by a special machine nozzle on the spray gun and encapsulating the ozone, so the three atom molecule inside of that tiny little water drop. So that was the first. Then we had to come to, uh, to envision what the coronavirus would be in the air. So transmission of the coronavirus is in the air. There is no report at the CDC of transmission of the coronavirus through services, not even one. It is therefore needed to stop the transmission in the air. The envelope coronavirus has no protection against the high oxidative stress of the of uh, ozogation. Shared air is the problem, and I keep pointing on air, not surface. The coronavirus is, is inactivated by diffusing through the protein coat into the nucleic acid core, resulting in damage of the RNA. The difference in molecular weight of the O3 versus O2 makes that the droplets move downwards and simultaneously disinfect the surfaces due to the half-life of ozonated water of about 20 minutes, leaving only oxygen. Why are we using water to carry the gaseous ozone? That's why we use water to carry the gaseous ozone. So AgriOcean International uses water as the carrier of the gaseous ozone because of the only possibly solubility in water and therefore nature's protection of, of over ozonating. What about safe opening our schools? Praying these chemicals, pesticides on the classroom services around the children, teachers, cust uh, custodians, and in the school buses is not the answer. That's why we designed and engineered and manufactured with our partners an air cleaning technology that compact mobile ozone apparatus and melt other functional misting process to safely and 100% inactivate the COVID-19 virus and the variants. Think with these kids, and I have to bring it up, but think of the future. Rest respiratory problems will be caused by all these chemicals and our children will face these respiratory problems in the future because they are every day surrounded by these chemicals. So safe 
opening our schools in the United States can only be done when, when we keep the chemicals out of it and have a 100% national solution. Thank you very much, it's Ernie. It's almost emotional. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. No. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, Peter, you know, I'm sure some people may have the basic question on the potential for harm. Uh, so with that, can I have your take on whether or not you think ozone is harmful in any way? Okay, that, that would be an obvious question that uh, a lot of people have asked me, because how could something be so powerful, kill bacteria, kill Asperia, lower my VODs, clean my drains? How, it has to be harmful. There has to be a downside to it. Well, it's sad to say there really isn't, because the machinery and the equipment that we use uh, runs at around one part per million to three parts per million. And that's enough, and I think science will agree, that's enough to kill bacteria, listeria, even COVID. We don't need higher levels. So all the equipment that goes into a plant, whether it's portable uh, or fixed equipment, is not designed to run and cannot run much higher than that. Also, most of the equipment is uh, computer controlled or uh, electronically controlled where it won't permit the ozone generator to exceed these limits. Uh, in fact, I use ozonated water in my water pick at home with no problem at all. Uh, safety concerns, yes, we're all interested in safety. We do monitoring with test kits and we want our customers to keep a log of the ozone levels. Uh, we have, and we usually begin with the systems, ozone monitored equipment. So if the levels in the air get to exceed the ocean limits, the equipment is automatically shut down. Uh, we're very conscious of safety because if something ran amok, people would smell it and evacuate the plant. The advantage of ozone it has such a pungent odor that People will smell it uh, way, way before it gets into any toxicity. That doesn't seem to be an issue, but we want to stress the safety aspect of using ozone, whether it's uh, aqueous or in a gas form. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Peter. And then, Ernie, I have one final question for you and then one final for James and Peter. Uh, Ernie, what is the largest capacity ozone generation system uh, that's been designed and engineered by Agriazine? The <clears throat> When we look into uh, agriculture in general, and the problems we have here now in Texas and probably in other parts of the United States, but it is so huge here, is the zebra mussels. God, that really uh, ruined the whole water source. Based on that factor, um, we were approached to look into a size, what can feed, for example, a, um, a pivot system, a pivot system that goes over the corn and bean field. Uh, a system like that, it uses about 750 gallons per minute. But instead of spraying uh, chemicals or in, in, in other scenarios, just water yeah, for irrigation, that 750 gallons per minute, when that could be ozonated water, as James just mentioned, just with a, a, a relatively low concentration, uh, could eliminate in that huge field in, in the midsection of, uh, of the United States, that huge amount of chemicals that is sprayed through these pivot systems and through uh, through spray planes. So coming back to your question, uh, and that's a little bit technical, but that's okay. Um, the largest capacity, what we designed and engineered, uh, is contained in a seven foot by 16 foot mobile trailer. And the largest ozone generation system produces, and uh, that's a lot, believe me, is 680 grams per hour. So compare it with uh, the units what we use now for uh, for the COVID, uh, run about uh, between the six and, and, and 10 grams per hour. Uh, when you 
compare that into pounds, so that means like 35 pounds per day, a 10% concentrate, what we can generate with that, uh, with that system. Uh, that has an oxygen, an oxygen capacity of 90 liters per minute with 93 uh, purity and a chiller capacity of two tons. Uh, and there is a special injection kit, of course, designed for, and I come back to what uh, James just said, for four parts per million dose rate. That means that we can uh, treat or ozonate 750 gallons per minute of water to do what it has to do. So in, in, the, uh, in the pivot system, or like I said, with a, uh, with a weighted uh, hose in, the, in, in, in a water source to, to fight the, the zebra metal uh, problem. Uh, that injection kit that uh, includes a 25 horsepower side stream injection pump, flash reactor, consumer injector, and back of the tech. So uh, I just wanted to show that ozugation is capable of solving a lot of disease causing problems throughout the world and provide us with a very safe and healthy future. So thank you. Thank you. That was it. Yeah, I appreciated the uh, question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ernie. Um, and Peter, one final question for you, uh, just so you know, people have a good understanding. Where can people use ozone in their plants today? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, before I answer that, I'd like to thank you and the company for letting me get on this illustrious panel, as well as some folks that have been my mentors over the years, Cameron Tapp from Clearwater, and Rick Rice, Gil Gordon, Chuck Sofer, Larry Killen. Those are the guys that put me in the ozone business and kept me in the ozone business. But that being said, the answer to your question is we go into a plant, we develop a relationship with the people in the plant, and we look for, now that we have this relationship, we look for the critical control points in the plant where we can use ozone intelligently. We uh, we have to have this relationship where we can go into a plant and with some degree of intelligence put ozone where it's needed uh, from a practical basis you can put ozone just about anywhere in a plant that water won't uh, hurry i like to put ozone in doorways for doorway sanitation i like to put them in machines that require water to operate, such as a lot of fish processing equipment, certainly in rubbish areas, like to put ozonated water in ice makers. And what we're finding now that we can use ozonated water in ingredients where it calls for water, marinades, gravies, etc., And that will certainly increase the shelf life as well as enhance the flavor of the the important thing about an ozone system, unlike uh, selling an air compressor, where I'll, here's an air compressor I'll see you in 10 years, is a continual relationship we have with the plant because we find that our customer base is constantly adding and having ideas and constantly adding ozone outlets, making the machine more efficient with the use of ozonated water and giving them, as I said before, a great level of protection, which everybody in the food business needs. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. Uh, appreciate that. And then finally now, James, last question for you is, what are some of the current uses that are in gas form today? Okay, thank you. Ozone gas, like, uh, is used to rid odors, smoke, bacteria, yeast and mold, and viruses from enclosed spaces like cars, buses, ambulances, rail cars, cruise ships, refrigerators. When ozone gas is used, the area must be sealed for the treatment and then allowed uh, time for the half-life to revert back from the O3 to the O2. And some this can be sped up, uh, for example, in a uh, a rail car or some closed space by using fresh air blower to blow out the ozone before it's uh, flipped back. One uh, 
interesting uses in doctors and, and dentists office as the staff leaves for the day the ozone generator turns on fills the whole office area with ozone gas and then in the middle of the night it turns off and it flips back the next morning that whole office and all the areas have been completely sanitized by the ozone uh, recently in the cannabis industry they're using ozone because it's not a pesticide Side. They can't use any pesticides on the cannabis plants. Um, and also, in California, the terpenes that the uh, cannabis produces during growing is offensive, and they're required by law now to put in an odor reduction system. And they're using the ozone to, to react with the terpenes and, and reduce the, uh, the odor coming off these areas. So those are three examples of the gaseous phase. Again, um, the areas have to be sealed during the process and allow the, um, to flip back from O2, from O3 to O2, and there's absolutely no residual at the end. That's good. Yeah, that's the uh, examples that I had. No, that's great. I appreciate that. Okay, so that brings me to the end of uh, my session. And, you know, every once in a while, I'm humbled and, and I feel I'm in the presence of real legends in the industry. And that's how I feel today. Uh, so James, Peter and Ernie, I want to personally thank you for your time today. This has been fascinating information for me as well as our listeners. And I think that it can and probably should be used in all operations today. Uh, but with that, I'm going to pass it back to Amy because I know we have a lot of questions that are coming in as well. So thanks again. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to our panel so much for joining us today. I know we're running a little bit short on time, so I just wanted to very quickly touch on a couple of our upcoming webinars that we have scheduled. All of these are free to register, so I do encourage you all to go to pdrfsi.com slash webinars and register for as many as you think you'll be interested in. We've got them scheduled all the way through June, so I'm sure there'll be something there to pique your interest. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and go into the question section because like I said, we had a ton of participation in the questions and I do hope you can stick around to listen to a couple of questions here. We may go over a few minutes, but I think it'll be worth our time. So let me see here. I'll pick a good first question for us and then I will have our speakers just have at it. So let me see. All right, I've got a question here regarding the approval of ozone use in Canada for food processing. Um, do you gentlemen know if it's um, approved in Canada? Yeah, I can take that because I dealt with the authorities years ago in the chain of fish plants up there. Uh, originally, we had a hard time and the inspector said you could use this uh, as just a sanitizing agent on equipment. We wanted to use it in the product. They were producing a lot of salmon and uh, coming across the border, our regulation said zero listeria. And the way we could get that would be with ozonation. But we did find a paragraph in the CFIAs that uh, in their handbook that allowed the use of ozone on the product itself. It's still an iffy kind of a thing, but we found it in writing and we, we we instituted a program of spray nozzles on uh, uh, pr production belts in the salmon plant. All right, thank you so much for that, Peter. All right, I've got a question here regarding the efficacy of ozone with mineralized water, such as well water. Um, so does mineral levels in the water have any impact on the efficacy of the ozone that's produced? Ernie, can you comment on that? I can't. <laughs> oh, I can, but I I was still listening and and go back to to the Canada story. Is 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 that okay, Amy? Yeah, if you want to comment on the uh, Canada question, that's fine. In, no, that's what I like to go back to for a second. Um, we use ozogation, of course, in the vineyards up in the, in Canada. 
And there was a whole report from the University of Saskatchewan that um, the use of ozone uh, or ozonation in the vineyards uh, increased dramatically the cold hardiness of the vines. So even in that cold climate there, they can grow grapes uh, by, uh, by using ozonation and, and like I said, increase the cold hardiness. Um, and also that uh, it uh, created a lot more resveratrol uh, in, in, in the grapes and therefore in, in the wine, but everybody knows that that is good, uh, good for your heart. So uh, the Canadians are very pleased with, uh, with the use of uh, ozonation in their, in, in their vineyards. Excellent. Did you have any Can thoughts on the question of well water? Yes, Peter, go ahead. Okay, just a fast answer because no good question should be unanswered. Uh, ozone will precipitate out uh, a lot of the minerals in well water. I've had experience with iron and manganese. Uh, it will inhibit the ozone. Obviously, the higher quality water, uh, the better off you are. But we have to be very careful if you're running high iron levels, which is common to well water because the iron precipitated out will just clog everything up. Uh, the manganese will turn everything pink. So we've got to be careful about well water. All right. Okay, I will, I, will add, I will add quick, uh, one little, little note to that. And that's absolutely right, Peter. You answered that question very well. Uh, when ozone is used uh, for the minerals in, in well water, and we did it, uh, I don't know how many times, but what happens is, so it's good for the, for the person who asked that question, what the ozone does is when we look at iron, for example, so the iron goes from the varus to the varic status. So it oxidizes the iron. That doesn't mean that the iron is gone. It is just in a different status. So ozogation goes together with uh, treatment or after uh, to filtration to remove that kind of minerals. So it's not a, it's not always it, it just by itself standing treatment. It is a combination of ozone with other uh, uh, filtration to uh, to take care of, of these minerals. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ernie. Um, all right, I've got a question here regarding um, if you could share any resources or studies regarding the efficacy of ozone regarding COVID-19. Are there any resources that people could look up? University of Tel Aviv. Yeah, I'm sorry, okay. Peter, Peter what, what was that you were saying? Well, University of Tel Aviv just released uh, a survey, a uh, study on uh, ozone gas uh, as far as fueling um, COVID-19. Uh, Zuckerman, uh, Zucker and Fleischman were the ones that did the study. And I say it just came out a few days ago. There was one before that, but I would take a look at the uh, study from Tel Aviv. Uh, it's just a couple of days old. All right, Ernie, did you have any other resources to mention as well? Yeah, there are. I think the latest what I got was there are, let's say about 20 uh, papers about it throughout the world, uh, mostly out of diff different countries out there, but very specified uh, research what was done uh, from ozone in relation towards, uh, towards COVID or yeah, to COVID. So there are a, a lot available, people can just Google it and it will and it will show up from all the diff, different sides of the world. Perfect. So the one from Tel Aviv, and then there's several others out there as well. I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Uh, all right. Yeah, there are uh, more of that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me see. Okay, we've got a question here for James. Um, in your experience as an auditor, uh, what common pitfalls have you seen in implementation of systems for ozone? Hmm. 
Well, I, I really can't see any pitfalls. I mean, I've, I've had quite a bit of experience in the seafood industry with the use of ozone, and it's been uh, highly uh, positive. And again, for sanitation and for direct product uh, application to increase shelf life and so on. So, you know, as an auditor, I can't do any consulting. So I can see systems where uh, ozone would be beneficial, but I can't really mention it because I can't be uh, consulting and auditing at the same time. So, you know, as far as people seeing and hearing things like what we're doing today and getting a hold of experts to come in and do a plan evaluation and see what works, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, the first time I was uh, involved with ozone was out in California, one of the big fruit processors, and he had a line of tractor trailers all full of fruit, and he had to process these as fast as he could. And again, to clean the apparatus after every load using ozone was no problem, whereas any other way would be very problematic, detergents and rinsing and so on and so forth, whereas ozone... You, you can use, you can leave some of the ozonated water in it and it'll go right through the system. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your insight, James. Um, I know we are a couple minutes past our scheduled end time and we have so many other great questions. So if you did have other additional questions that we're unfortunately not able to touch on, um, I do encourage everyone to forward their questions on to PJRFSI. You can send any questions you have to PJRFSI at PJRFSI.com. Or if you go to our website, there is a page full of contact information and, and other ways to reach out. So gentlemen, just once again, I wanna thank you all for taking the time out of your schedules. I'm sure you're very busy to present for us and discuss the topic that you're all so, um, so knowledgeable in. It's really eye-opening. Personally, I can't say I ever had heard of ozone as a sterilization technique. So it's really eye-opening and fascinating. And thank you again to all of our attendees. Thank you so much for all the great participation. Uh, this is probably the most questions we've gotten on a single webinar in quite a while, and I do appreciate seeing that. Um, gentlemen, any parting words of wisdom before we wrap things up? Ernie, any parting words? Oh, I just see a sign here in my office when I look over the computer, and it says, let's uncorking nature's way to purer winemaking. In other words, what I want to say is, the world is looking for wine made from grapes that are not treated with chemicals. So people are starting more and more looking at pure winemaking. That's a big sign, but I saw this on the other side of my office. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, conclude with that. Thank you, Ernie. Yeah, and what is what is life without wine, seriously? James, any parting word of, words of wisdom excuse me, words of wisdom from your perspective before we sign off today? Well, as far as I'm concerned, just think of the possible applications and start thinking ozone. Absolutely, thank you so much. Peter, anything from you before we leave? Yeah, I'm gonna be selfish and just close with the fact that oh, since I got in the ozone business, it's given me a tremendous level of satisfaction that I can go into a food plant, I can improve the facility, I can improve the product, I can see new markets for the uh, processor, and it's just a tremendous bit of satisfaction to know that I can improve the not only the plant itself, but I can improve the customers and the consumers at this level. Thank you. Peter, that doesn't sound selfish at all. <laughs> thank you all again, gentlemen, and thank you to all of our attendees. On behalf of PGRFSI, I'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy rest of your week, and we'll hope to see you on the next webinar. Have a great day.